I'm watching my old video here because I have to remember how to remove the counter shaft and the main shaft and then reassembly of everything. The book is fine. The Volvo Green Book, ah, uh, you can't tell from just looking at my screen, but every single page of its very few pages of information on actually replacing, rebuilding the gearbox portion of the transmission is just littered with special tools. Every picture is like, oh, go ahead and put this special tool, it's a cage on here, and then put this special tool that's a cage inside of here, and then put the bracket special tool, and then the roller extractor, and I'm like, come on, guys. Let's just all collectively be thankful for Chilton's, Haynes, Bentley, all the other aftermarket guys that go through with a full page of photos. Well, the counter shaft is in place. I just set it in. Now the main shaft, when you're cleaning everything, uh, be careful that you don't clean it all at once. Clean it in stages. When you identify a part, there are things you want to look for. Check out the witness marks on this thrust washer. If I mixed this up, I would need to guess where it belongs. And these um, witness marks do line up with the back of my main shaft. So that actually is a useful tool for identifying the appropriate location of things, and now I'm gonna clean it. And then immediately after that, I'm gonna mix up which side is inside and out. Now with the M4, with the M40 and the M41, I would never do the wire step because that always seemed like you could get away without it. And on this one, you, there's a lot of wiggling and finessing to get this whole thing in place that I do think the wire trick is actually necessary here. So we'll take our steepest of angles Unreal. Come on, get back in there. What in tarnation? Am I doing the wrong end? Yeah, that'll explain it. I'm dumb. Well, I suppose I should be grateful that it didn't go in, because I'm not ready to be a father. Much better when you're on the correct end. Okay, let's try it this way. There we go, we have to engage the dogs on that second gear, the straight cut gear. We're in. Main shaft assembly, wired and installed. Insert the input shaft roller bearing. Not looking forward to these, but input shaft. The input shaft has the roller bearings in a cage here and apply a little grease to them. And there's the tapered cone and the front bearing on it. I suppose this is the moment. Remove the wire. Fit the synchro ring to the front end of the main shaft and then install the input shaft to the front end of the main shaft. The synchro ring is in place. So up to this point, the counter shaft is installed, just dropped in a box. The main shaft is in with the wire. The flange is on the outside like that. So this much of the bearing gets hammered into the box lip here. Okay, as we recall from part one, this now gets put into the box, but first have a look inside, make sure your dogs are all in place. The front gear is attached, and the spring clip and, this, uh, and the cone for the synchronizer, which is essentially one of these. Hang on a second, what are you doing here? And it actually sits on here. Wow, I almost forgot it. While I'm instructing you on how to do it, I almost forgot it myself. What a silly thing to do. But first, we need to install the bearing to the input shaft. And the lip is the outside portion. One of the races for the other bearings actually made it really easy to act as a driver because it was the right size to hit only the inside race with just enough clearance there to make it quite useful. Thank you for your service. With the bearing now hammered on, let's attach the lock ring. Has to go down a little bit more. Looks like that's perfect. Bearing is happy. Right, now for my next trick, we need to hammer this onto the trans. Okay, I've greased the inside bearing. Let us line up the three indentations on the ring with the three dogs in the gearbox. Well, there's a bit of a balancing game. All right, maybe I cut the wire too soon. Oh, absolutely I did. Well, back end's coming off. They don't say when to cut the wire, actually. 
But I don't like the things keep slipping out the rear. It feels like it's working, but it is going sideways. Much better. I'm holding the rear because that final gear, the largest one, it's continually threatening to go back out. But now is the time to remove the wire because, well, this is going in the place of it. So they don't say when to remove it. And I guess that marks sense, but just keep an eye on that rear gear. You don't want it dropping out because the hammering here will have it slide off. The dogs will fall out, the ring, the, the circ clip that holds them. And then you, if it gets even worse, the needle bearings could give you some drama. This is going swimmingly easily into the hole here. I don't know if it's because I greased it first or just the function of the clearances. Beautiful. I don't think there's enough room with the front bearing hammered in and flush with the ceiling ring. Very nice, convenient for the rear here to slide out, but I still wanna make sure that everything's clear. Right, it's definitely grinding because the shaft is just chilling. Here is the rear bearing. Looks almost like the front, slightly smaller. This is the M400 and M410 rear bearing. Ooh, smooth as butter. Yeah, this one's tricky because we're installing it on the shaft and then into the box at the same time. So you can see the need for a pipe. I wonder if the old horrible freight pipe will fit. Hi, she does. That was enough to get it started and in the correct position. Light strokes, light strokes. Gotta watch, make sure that the front bearing doesn't decide to come out. Spin it, everything's good. The front is budging a little bit. The tone just changed in the last few hammerings. And yes, I borrowed the sleeve from the rear speedometer most inappropriately, but it seemed to be a solid piece of metal and I just needed something to overcome that larger lip because this, see that larger lip there? The pipe here wouldn't fit and well, this was just exactly the right thing I needed. Oh, I'm just making this all up as I go. What's next? Install the main shaft rear, we did that. We are now on to fitting the circlip. Oh, there's a circlip. That means you need to go in even more. Uh-oh. So there's a little bit of wiggle room in the entire um, main shaft rear section. And I need to take that up without pushing the front out. And I think if I just hold my hand in here, I should be able to help it along. But not much, just a little bit, just a smidge. See, I can turn the front shaft nicely, I can turn the rear shaft very nicely. Now the rear locking ring. That ought to do it. Could be that it's there, it's just so tight that there's really very little. Yeah, it's, it's there, it's just really tight clearances, so I'm actually gonna tap this in. All around, just to make sure we're seated. The circlip on this end was a little wobbly and slightly bent. I think that's what was making it very difficult. But once I got one side started, just tapping around really seems to take care of the rest. Great, another step completed. I think the most difficult one is the next one and that is the counter shaft bearings because the front and rear, while they are thankfully different sizes, have to get driven in, but I'm confident it won't be so bad. Install the countershaft bearing center races. Support the ends of the countershaft and drive in the outer tracks. So the countershaft is still loose in here. This could be really easy or it could be very difficult. One important thing is keep making sure that it spins once it's started. Um, I'm gonna start both ends and that will essentially lift the shaft up and allow all the gears to mesh so that it spins freely. Okay, and contaminated. Uh, see, it's got some spin to it, but the mesh is not good. Well, now that it's started, let me flip it over and see if that helps. Makes no difference. Ooh, it 
doesn't spin at all. Great. Do the same for the front. That's beautiful. I found the issue and I, I think it won't be too much work to fix it, but if you look down here, this is a gap in this tooth. Um, there's a gap in this ring here for the first, second gear? I don't know what gear, Sec I think second. And the dog for it is over here. So what happened was um, as it was sliding out one of the times I must not have rotated it back in the same spot and put it back in. So the dog is binding and actually this underneath it is the spring clip. It has come out and that tells me that the other ones are also coming out and that's why it won't make a full rotation without binding. So I need to pull this gear apart which will involve, oh, I don't know about the counter shaft portion but at least the main shaft bearings need to pull out a bit. Hopefully it's not too much work now. This one's easier to slide in and out but if I can get them back enough to increase the gap enough. Oof, that's going to be tough. Well, I'm optimistic that I don't have to do anything with these. Now, these are the real woozies here, but that's, it just happens. So I'll try to get this all put back together, um, torn apart a little bit more so I can reorient the synchros and the spring clip and then put it all back together. Oh, wow. We, that was about a two hour adjustment and it wasn't something that I did it was something that I think I overlooked uh, let's study the photo here of the synchros the way they're supposed to fit so here's the um, here's the dog and each of these dogs has a spring ring that goes in it and then it sits inside of the hub like that so this out here is the drive gear or the um, oh it's called the synchro hub and the synchro hub has these gaps here and I thought that the gaps were where the dogs were supposed to slide in and out um, relative to the larger gear which is the centralizing resilient ring that's called the synchro isn't it anyway some of these terms are a little confusing the pictures help a lot what was happening is the whole assembly rotated and it rotated one side more than the other side and then that dislodged the relative uh, and it happened while the back half was still being hammered in so there was some gap and then it allowed it to kind of slip out of position because you could see here in this picture there are two of the snap rings one on either side of the synchro and then the hub which slides back and forth with the shift forks so this hub here was as it was i'm like nervous now to slide it over into the other gear because i haven't attached the snap rings but it should be fine now all right so as you snap it into one gear um, you feel the detent of those circle springs. And one of them was basically out of position and jamming. And so as you would rotate, it would flex and come up against a bump and then cause uh, some, some drama. You know what the synchro ring looks like, and it's got some bumps and some gaps in it. But really what I thought had happened originally was that flat spot here in the hub that you see was where the dog was supposed to go. And that's not really the problem. The problem was just that the synchro spun and it knocked the spring clip out of location. So the important thing is that on each of these brass synchro rings, um, the gaps here didn't seem to be where everything attached. It's actually, I don't know what they're there for, but the dog is in here and there's this cutout in the synchro and that's where the dog needs to attach. Otherwise it was on the other side of the cutout and that was the jam. So, it looks like right now everything is good. You see, I put some grease in here because I wanted to hold it all back in one spot while I was reattaching it, and then I couldn't see if it was back in position. Oh boy, it's gonna be a late night, folks, because I'm committed to getting this overdrive in. So let us carry on. Um, the good news is I didn't have to extract these bottom bearings, but I did hammer the snot out of these rings, and um, it's 
possible that I, I caused some damage to the bearing because I'm flexing this to try to slide it from there out. And that is stressing the balls a little bit, but I'm confident it's still gonna be okay. Just as a heads up, every step of the way, take a look at those synchros. They are the biggest drama and these snap circle rings, uh, that is the biggest drama of the entire operation, I think, more than hammering bearings in and out. Also, the one of the longer time-consuming tasks was just getting these back off. Oh my goodness, you need some heavy-duty snap ring pliers. This might be adequate enough to, you know, get them on, but uh-uh, not even close for removing something like that. I've had snap rings like this break. I think I over extended it or something, but um, I'm always nervous after that, that something like this could break, but they really did take a lot of beating. They're actually a little bent too from all the fighting. I have to reinstall those snap rings. I need to then get, uh, that'll be almost it for the gearbox. I will then confirm that everything's fine. And then I will um, attach the shift forks. Very straightforward and using the photos here, that's actually gonna be a big help so study this picture, pause and look, because I will not be stopping anymore to talk it out. I just gotta press on forward. It's assembled and I feel good about that. I feel confident that it's in good shape and it'll operate well and I tried several times over every change that I or every piece that was assembled I would go in and engage every gear and try and make sure that it's not binding anywhere and it looks good. So far so good. Uh, unfortunately only two balls are around the steel balls and I'm looking for number three. I don't know where she be. Big garage. Now it's time to start making the way over to the overdrive, which will be fun. And yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk it out a little bit. There are shims on the counter shaft. Hmm. And it says if no new components are being used, you can reuse the shims and you don't have to worry. But if you're changing things, you need to put new shims and check the end play. I don't know how to do that. Oh look, a diagram. Zero, 2.002 .002 inches. Oh boy. That's zero to one. It's half of a tenth of a millimeter. Cool. Oh, that's five hundredths. Cool. If no new components have been fitted, the original shims can be replaced against the countershaft rear bearing outer track. If new components and bearings have been installed, the countershaft end float must now be checked. To do this, tap the countershaft in a forward direction until its front bearing is stopped by the clutch bell housing. The rear bearing outer track will now lie slightly below the surface of the end of the gear casing. Wow, I'm tired. And shims should be fitted to provide either no countershaft end float at all, or a clearance. Clearness? Clearness. That's not me. That's definitely the word clearness. Not exceeding 0 0.002 inches. That is two thousandths of an inch, or five hundredths of a millimeter. I know that I just said that out loud, but I don't think I understood what it meant because I'm still thinking about that ball. So with the front bolted up, that counter shaft should have zero. And right now it's got plus. The reason for all that, I believe, is one, yeah, we haven't hammered it forward into the bell housing. Two, that's going to make everything a little tricky to maneuver around. Three, I don't actually know where my bell housing went. I do remember that I need to pressure wash it, but... Uh, four. These bearings might have some wobble still to them, so that could be tricky. And what do we hammer? It says tap the countershaft forward, but what if the bearings aren't 
I don't know. I feel like there's still some wiggle and wobble in those new bearings. Either way, we got two shims, which uh, make up the equivalence of a sheet of paper, I guess. I really shouldn't work this late, but I got to find that ball. Maybe then I'll call it. Yeah.